The Kremlin is now warning that Ukraine will pay if Germany and others provide tanks to help them in the war effort. Western leaders are still debating if and when to send German name German made Leopard 2 combat tanks over there, as President Zelensky has really been pleading for them now for weeks. Fred Pleiken is live in Kyiv with more on this for us. Fred, what are you hearing about this latest threat from from Russia now over these tanks? Yeah, this threat was actually made by the Kremlin uh, earlier today, Kate, and it was the spokesman for the Kremlin, Dmitry Peskov, who said that if these Western-made battle tanks, no matter where they come from, but of course especially these Leopard 2 battle tanks that are made in Germany, go to Ukraine, that the Ukrainians would then pay. Obviously, the Russians are saying that there would be massive retaliation on their part. This is, of course, something that we've heard from the Russians in the past. If you recall, when the U.S. started sending those HIMARS, multiple rocket launching systems, to uh, Ukraine, the Russians were then threatening to hit decision-making centers in Kiev and in other cities as well. So far, that, that really hasn't happened to the extent that Russia said that it would. Nevertheless, these main battle tanks are a huge topic here in Kiev among the Ukrainians. Uh, we've been hearing from Ukrainian officials. We've spoken to some who said that they absolutely need them because they're actually running out of spare parts for the Soviet main battle tanks that they have, also running out of ammo as well. Very difficult to source that internationally also. The Ukrainians say they need about 300 to 400 modern Western battle tanks to really be able to turn the tide. And as you correctly said, right now it's still difficult internationally, especially for those German-made ones, the Leopard 2s. The Poles are saying they want those to be sent. They own them, but they have to ask Germany for permission to send them. The Germans are saying they'll allow those tanks to be sent if the U.S. sends Abrams tanks. Now, we know the U.S. is not there yet. They think that the Abrams are not suited for the battlefields here in Ukraine. The maintenance is also difficult. The Germans say something's being worked out at the moment. They're simply not there yet, but certainly a lot of these countries do see the necessities of these Western battle tanks to come here to the battlefields in Ukraine, Kate. If they didn't before, there's definitely a change in tone that they're, they see it now. That's for sure. It's great to see you, Fred. Thank you for being there. Joining me now for more on this is Democratic Congresswoman from Pennsylvania, Chrissy Houlihan. She sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Congresswoman, thank you for, for, for being here. When you hear Ru the Russian government say Ukraine will pay if anyone sends in tanks, what do you make of that threat? As uh, what the person who was previous to me said, uh, it, it feels as though we've heard this threat before. And frankly, um, the actions of the Russians are inexplicably um, um, aggressive. And I think that they should totally expect that we would answer with these kinds of weapon systems. I have actually been not only on the Armed Services Committee, but also on the Foreign Affairs Committee, advocating for us as Americans, as the United States, to make sure that we are equipping the Ukrainians with everything that they are asking for, and that includes, at this point, tanks. Uh, I don't think the saber-rattling saber from Russia should be something to, that should stop us or our allies from being able to be supportive of Ukraine uh, as they fight for democracies around the world. And Congresswoman, if it is saber-rattling, we, as you've said, we've heard this threat before. It's not like it's stopped Russia from being ruthless. At its core, then, what do you think is driving the hesitancy from Germany? What is the hesitancy drive? What, what do you think is driving the hesitancy um, that, from the U.S. to send tanks at this point? So it really does sound as though there is some some work to be done in terms of the uh, conversations between our, those allies, both the United States and Germany. And I am heartened by the conversation that comes out of the Armed Services Committee from my chairman, Chairman McCall, who recently said that we need to make sure that we are uh, answering the call from Ukraine for everything that they need. And that there is a process that needs to happen here domestically to educate both our Congress and also our administration and our DOD to make it possible for us to be able to do that. And then I believe that Germany will follow along or follow suit. That has been sort of the pattern since the beginning of the war a few hundred years, uh, sorry, a few hundred days ago. I, I want to play for you, kind of right along the lines of what you're talking about, play for you how the Republican chairman of foreign affairs, Michael McCall, how he responded to concern that the new Republican majority might not be as supportive of sending aid to Ukraine in the future. Let me play this. We have to educate our members. I don't think they quite understand what is at stake. If Ukraine falls, Chairman Xi and China is going to invade Taiwan. And it's, it's Russia, China, Iran who's putting drones in Crimea, and North Korea that's putting uh, artillery into uh, Russia. They have to understand the case. Do you see that as well? I mean, what, what is it going to take to convince these skeptics? 
Absolutely. And I, I hope that now that the Republicans uh, have the majority in the House of Representatives, and I hope that now that Chairman McCall is chairman, that uh, those folks on the other side of the aisle, the Republicans on the other side of the aisle, will start really listening to the chairman uh, as he articulates, I think, very, very well what's at stake here. This is not just about Ukraine. This is, in fact, the world watching what happens for Ukraine to Ukraine so that we can make sure that we protect, as I mentioned, democracies around the world. And the implications of a failure in Ukraine are global. And so I am very grateful that uh, the very committees that I sit on, Armed Services and Foreign Affairs, have been resolute in their unification, in their unity, um, with both Republicans and Democrats alike. I know recently another trip to Ukraine, uh, a congressional delegation from Ukraine just came back. I had the opportunity to go myself and speak with President Zelensky very early on. Uh, and nothing has changed, really, other than we need to continue to support Ukraine. Yeah, it is, it's, it is also important to point out that when there is bipartisan support around these issues, and we see that in the work that you're doing on the committee. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I appreciate your time. Let's get some perspective from CNN military analyst, retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling. General, good to have you on this morning. Great to be with you, Jim. So President Zelensky says there's no alternative to battle tanks like this, but there is a school of thought, uh, including on the U.S. side, that, that tanks are not what Ukraine needs right now, and that there are a whole host of challenges standing in the way uh, of them being a true game changer on the ground. So what's your view? Jim, I think we have to go back to what the goal has been from various allies, and which has been led by Secretary Austin. The goal is to provide Ukraine with the kind of equipment that they can immediately use, which will have a positive effect on the battlefield, and which Ukraine can easily sustain. Yeah. All three of those uh, factors are, are really dynamic in terms of decision making on what equipment that they need. Now, when you talk about tanks, uh, that requires sovereign decisions on the part of the Western Alliance, like we're seeing with, with uh, Germany right now. But there's a lot of complexity behind decision making process. The availability mm -hmm. of the vehicles, the ammo, the parts, the fuel, the training requirements, uh, the ab ability of the gaining unit to sustain the vehicles on a highly mobile and high op tempo and dynamic battlefield interconnectedness with other allies, the military goals of the operation. We could discuss those ad nauseum, but the yeah. fact of the matter is, to answer your question, yes, you, it would be great to give Ukraine tanks and have them fall into their battle positions without a need to train or sustain the Ukrainian army on them, but that's not going to happen really soon. Uh, other nations have donated a whole lot of combat vehicles that I think mm -hmm. will contribute significantly to the kind of operations Ukraine is going to be conducting in the very near future. Yeah, that, that's the point I've heard is that they've had a lot of success with these kind of small unit, uh, small unit forces, highly nimble, right, in terms of attacking Russian armor, which is frankly far more numerous there. I mean, is there something else then that you believe Ukraine needs more of and quickly. I know that there's been a constant frustration from the Ukrainian side, sort of, thank you for all you're giving us, but we need more and we need it faster. Yeah, you know what I'd say? I mean, when, when the announcement was made for the Bradleys and the Strikers, I thought those were very good complementary vehicles to what Ukraine is trying to do. They mm. want to move fast without a long and, and dynamic supply line, and they want to have a lot of tank killing capability. Both of those vehicles, if you put you yeah. know, uh, 10 soldiers in the back of a striker with each one with a javelin, you can really get behind enemy lines very quickly, get through the front. It is an infantry bus. It doesn't have a lot of weapon systems on the vehicle itself, but what's in the back yeah. of the vehicle is critically important. Same thing for the Bradley. Bradley's got tow killers and a lot of yeah. infantrymen in the back. That's right. I mean, you mentioned the Javelin. That's a tank killer. The Bradley has the tow missile, uh, which could also kill tanks. C can you give a sense of where this war stands? It's been a brutal battlefield. I think a lot of folks at home just don't know the, the, the level of casualties that are happening on a daily basis on this eastern front. You hear of death tolls, sadly, amounting in the dozens every single day. I mean, is that, have we reached something of a war of attrition there in, in the east? It, it has been a war of attrition since about April, Jim, but yeah. the, the attrition, truthfully, and I watch this battle every day very closely, what you're seeing is not dozens of casualties on the front lines, you're seeing hundreds. You know, Mark Milley, General Milley said the other day that Russia has sustained close to 100,000 casualties. That's unfathomable, 
and that's yeah. lower than what Ukraine is suggesting they have yeah. suffered. They're, they're putting the numbers up at about 120,000 in 11 months of war. Of course, Ukraine, we don't know how many casualties they've suffered, but I'd suggest it's an awful lot. This yeah. is a yeah. World War II battlefield, yeah. and it's just unbelievably dramatic and challenging. And uh, what we're seeing right now is not a stalemate. There are a lot of battles going on, as you've reported multiple times, mm -hmm. both in the east and the southeast. Russia is trying to get more mobilized soldiers. Unfortunately, those soldiers are not trained, so they're mm -hmm. more cannon fodder or meat, as they say in Russia, to yeah. the front line. And Ukraine's trying to get moving and conduct operations that are offensive in nature. Yeah, that, that phrase, cannon meat, has always struck me as a demonstration of the lack of protection, respect that uh, Russia often has for its frontline forces. Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, good to have you on. Great to be with you, Jim. Thanks.